So to start off our discussion of small scale fading, we're going to focus on the continuous time small scale fading channel response. Now, if you think back to the block diagram on our previous slide, you'll recall that there was a linear system response H that basically captured the effects of all of the reflected copies of the transmitted signal arriving and combining together constructively and destructively at the receiving antenna. And so in order to understand small scale fading, and small scale fading So to kick off our discussion of small scale fading, recall that small scale fading basically captures the effects of all of the multipath reflections of the transmitted signal. So whenever you transmit a wireless signal, you don't get just one copy of the transmitted signal at the receive antenna. You get many different copies due to the reflections of the transmitted signal in the environment. And these different copies of the transmitted signal are going to arrive at the receive antenna at different time delays and are going to combine either constructively or destructively. And as we're going to see, this causes variation in power, smearing or dispersion of the transmitted signal. And all of these effects are captured by the small scale fading um, channel model, or small scale fading portion of the wireless channel model. The small scale fading effects are all sort of captured in that linear system response H that we saw in our previous slide. So the first thing we're going to do in the small scale fading module, or section of the module, is to take a look at that system response in detail really understand it and then use it as a springboard to talk about things like random fluctuations in received power due to multipath or dispersion due to multipath. The best way to start understanding the small scale fading uh, channel response is to look at an equation for the received wireless signal. So here we have the received wireless signal Y being equal to a number of reflected components of the transmitted signal X. And so here again what happens is the transmitted signal X is reflected many times in its environment. These reflections all arrive at different time delays at the receive antenna and the summation of all of these components is what's represented by um, this summation sign. Now because all of these reflections are being caused by the transmitted signal bouncing off objects that are in different physical locations, all of these reflections have a different distance to travel to the receive antenna. As a result, they are going to arrive at different times. And so what we have here is a delay component tau. So the, the subscript k indicates the kth multipath reflection. And the delay component tau is essentially just the delay due to the extra distance that the multipath reflection has to channel or has to travel. Now you'll notice that this delay component is a function of time, and that's to model motion in the environment. Motion both by the wireless devices themselves and by the objects in the environment. So if we're dealing with a mobile cellular telephone, for example, as you walk with your phone, you're going to get closer to some of the reflecting objects in the environment and further away from others. As a result, the delay that you experience, or the delay that these reflected copies of the signal experience, are going to change with time. The final component of this equation are these coefficients c. Now, as a signal
bounces off of an object or refracts around the edge of an object, it's the signal is going to experience a reduction in its power. There's going to be some attenuation or loss anytime you, you bounce off, off an object. Also, there's going to be different amounts of attenuation in these different multipath components just due to the fact that they're all traveling different distances. And so the different attenuations of these signal components are all captured by these coefficients c of k. Again, these coefficients are a function of time as well because as the mobile or as the environment changes with time the effects on these multipath reflections will change with time as well. So if we want to then express this effect or these these reflections as an equivalent system response H we can do it as follows. So we essentially just replace the transmitted signal component X with a delta function that occurs at the same delays and is weighted by the same sort of attenuations that we saw in our first equation. And so basically, if you convolve the transmitted signal x with this sort of second system response equation, you get the first equation because the delta functions will simply delay the transmitted signal x by the amount tau k and the weighting component in front of the delta functions will weight the, the component of x accordingly. So we call this equation the system response h. Now you'll notice that the system response is a function of two time variables. The first time variable, tau, is the convolution time variable. And so that's, that's the, the time axis that you perform your convolution along. The second component, t, controls the variation in the actual channel or the actual system response parameters. So again, this isn't really a linear time invariant system, it's a linear time variant system. And so as time progresses, the weights and the delays change. And so the sort of classical way to represent these variations um, or sort of the, the classical way to represent this time variant channel impulse response is with the following picture. So you'll notice on this picture we have our time axes. So the time axis tau again is the, the time axis along which we perform our convolution and the time axis t controls the variation in our system parameters. And so essentially what I've drawn here is a series of channel impulse responses that are sort of stacked together like you would maybe stack dishes in a, in a drying rack. And so this first channel response, I'll just draw a circle around it, And so this first channel response essentially represents the multipath conditions or the, the system response at a particular time, let's say t0, or let's say time 0, right? So you, you enter an environment, it's time 0, you start transmitting, and these delta functions represent the positions or the effects of all of the, the multipath components. Now, let's say some time passes, you walk into the room, and as you walk into the room, your relative location to the reflectors changes, and as a result, the response of the channel is going to change as well. And so rather than being represented by the first channel impulse response, after a little bit of time passes, we get this second channel impulse response that I've underlined. And so the channel impulse response itself changes. And again, 
as you continue into the room, maybe the people in the room change, you move around a little bit more, the impulse response continues to change, and after some more time passes, this is the impulse response that you get here. And so the impulse response, or the system response itself, changes with time. Now, the key thing to recognize, and we're going to see this in more detail later on, the key thing to recognize is that the variations in the system response are relatively slow compared to the duration of the transmitted symbols. And so the variation in the system response tends to occur on a time scale that's sort of on the order of several milliseconds, several tens of milliseconds, and the transmitted information symbols, you know, for a system with data rates of you know, tens or hundreds of megabits per second tend to be kind of on the nanosecond time scale, tens of nanoseconds. And so these impulse responses, even though they are changing with time, they will be relatively constant for many, many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of information symbols. And so from the information symbol perspective, we can basically consider the channel as a time invariant channel. We can use convolution to calculate the received signal, which is essentially what we did up here with our um, with our two equations up here. But very gradually over time, the the re response of the channel will change, and we'll learn in later modules how to characterize exactly the rate of change and the nature of that change. But the key thing to recognize here. And the key thing to sort of picture in your mind always is this sort of picture where you've got a bunch of slices of channel, different channel impulse responses, and as time passes, you sort of go from one channel impulse response to the other in a very sort of gradually changing fashion. While the continuous time impulse response model for small-scale fading is very a very useful way to visualize small-scale fading. The next very important step that we're going to take is to convert that continuous time multipath reflection model into a discrete time model. And the reason why this is so important is because all of the system wireless system simulation that you will do as part of this course and afterwards will be done in discrete time. So there's no such thing as a truly continuous time simulation. All simulations are done in discrete time. And so it's very useful and important to translate the small scale fading response into a discrete time model. And once we do that, that's basically where we're going to stay. So let's start by assuming a finite bandwidth for our transmitted signal x of t is a single-sided bandwidth of w. When we do that, we can represent the transmitted signal x as a series of samples, x of n, multiplied by shifted and added sync functions. And this, of course, is just Nyqu Nyquist's theorem. Right? And so this equation is, is simply Nyquist's theorem. So that's one way to look at it. Another way, if you want to take a communications perspective, is to think of the sync pulse as sort of the, the pulse shaping pulse used by the communication system, and these samples, x of n, as the actual discrete information symbols that are being transmitted. So in order to get our received signal y of t, we just convolve our transmitted signal x, expressed in this Nyquist summation form, with the equation from the previous slide for our time varying channel impulse response. And what we get when we're done that is this relatively long expression here. What I'm going to be doing in the next few steps is basically just kind of manipulating this equation a bit. Um, it's not going to be immediately obvious what this buys us in the first couple steps, but this is all going to help us work towards a discrete time 
model for the small scale fading in the wireless channel. And so what we do is we, if the, the transmitted signal is expressed in terms of samples or in terms of discrete time, the receive, we should express the received signal in discrete time as well. So we sample y of t at a rate of 2 times the single sided bandwidth of the, the transmitted signal. And the index m is the sample index for our received signal. And essentially all we've done is we've just replaced the variable t in this earlier equation with m times t in, in this equation. Otherwise it's exactly the same equation. Going from this equation to the final one, we basically just change our index. We, do, we just do a, a variable substitution. So we define the index L as being equal to M minus N. And then we just substitute in all of the, or then we just substitute in L and we eliminate the, the summation index N. So we sum over L rather than N. And instead of having N here, our index becomes M minus L. And what that buys us here in this top equation, we had M minus N, and the M minus N is just replaced by L. So we get a little bit of a simplification in our equation, but as we're going to see in the next slide, it helps us work towards a more compact, easier to handle, discrete time, small scale fading channel response. Okay, so I've just copied the last equation from the previous slide to the top of this one, so we have a little bit more room to work. So this is a, even with the summation index substitution, this is still a pretty long and complicated equation. So what I'm going to do is, uh, is I'm going to write the sampled received signal y of m using a fairly drastic simplification. So what we've got here is so at the, at the front of the top equation, we had a summation of essentially delayed versions of x, right? So m is the time index for the receive signal. And the summation index l essentially delays the different copies of the transmitted signal x. So you can think of it kind of as different multipath delays of the transmitted signal x. And so down here in the second equation, we have the summation over L. We have the delayed versions of the transmitted signal X. And what we've done here is we've taken this very large term and we've expressed it as in a much more compact form. So we've expressed it as H with the subscript L as a function of the time index N. Now, let's take a look at that to see if it makes sense. So here, when we look at this top term, we have the time index M and the time index M. And we have the index L essentially shifting the, the sync functions. And so, and all the other variables, T, and k are sort of self-contained within the within the, the variable h. And so what we've got here then with this much more compact second expression that I'll just circle here is a received signal equation that is very, very reminiscent of the very first received signal equation that we wrote down for continuous time we have several delayed, a summation of several delayed versions of the transmitted signal X 
multiplied by a coefficient before it was c in the previous equation, now it's h, multiplied by a coefficient that is a function essentially of all the, the multipath reflections in the channel. And so this equation I have circled here is essentially our discrete time multipath equation. And I can write down the equation for the coefficient hl of m as just being equal to that big summation in the, in the top equation. So we can think now of h as basically being the discrete time multipath coefficient that goes along with each of the different uh, time delays due to the, the different reflections. Now a really great way to visualize the discrete time multipath channel model is as a tap delay line or essentially a, an FIR or finite impulse response discrete time filter. So if you recall the received signal Y, which we have down here, the received signal Y was a summation of several different delayed versions of the transmitted signal X, which we have at the input to our tap delay line, multiplied by a bunch of different complex channel terms, H, each one essentially representing a different discrete time multipath reflection. And so H0 in this diagram would multiply the signal X with no delay at all. And so if you like, you can think of that as the first multipath arrival. Then the signal X is delayed by a single sample, then multiplied by H1 and added to form the received signal Y, and so on and so on. And so basically, each of these delay elements in the, the tap delay line represent another additional delay due to multipath reflection, or that represent multipath reflections that have to travel a little bit further. And these coefficients h represent the attenuation due to the path followed by each of the their respective multipath reflections. And the coefficients h are a function of time because they will change as the environment changes or as a mobile transmitter or receiver moves through their environment. So this tap delay line model is a very important one to understand and it's very commonly used to represent multipath reflections in discrete time. Okay, so the tap delay line model is very important and as we can see the the tap weights are expressed by the coefficients h0, h1, and, and so on. Now, a couple of slides ago, I gave the equation for hl at time m, and that's fine, but there actually is kind of an intuitive way of interpreting exactly what those h coefficients are. So I want to focus on that for just a, a few more minutes before we move on. So this is the equation I gave a couple of slides ago the discrete time channel tap, the elf channel tap, is equal to a summation of a whole bunch of terms. Now let's take a look at those terms. So recall that CK is the, or recall that C is the complex sort of weight or coefficient of the continuous time multipath reflection that occurs at a delay, whoops, tau k, right? And a, both the complex weight and the delay will change with time, which is represented by the sample index m multiplied by the sample interval t. So clearly h is a function of the continuous time delay and the continuous time channel weight. But how exactly is, relate, is it related? Well, we see that we've got these sync terms here. Now, let's just consider 
for a moment the kth term. So the complex weight CK is multiplied by a sink function that is essentially delayed by the kth or the, the propagation delay of the kth multipath component. And so you can think of each discrete, or sorry, you can think of each continuous time multipath reflection as being represented by a sink function that's weighted by ck and delayed by tau k. And so all of the continuous time multipath reflections will be these sink functions that will all have the, the different multipath uh, time offsets. So basically, the term, the discrete time channel term, the elf discrete time channel term, is a summation of all of the continuous time sync functions, multipath sync functions, that line up at a particular sampling interval. And this is made much more clear by an example. So. Let's consider a signal that has a single-sided bandwidth of 50 megahertz, and it's sampled at 1 over twice that bandwidth. And we're dealing with a channel that has only three continuous time multipath components. The, just to keep things simple, the amplitude or the weight of those three continuous time multipath components is all equal to one. The first multi continuous time multipath component arrives with a delay of five nanoseconds. The second one arrives with a delay of 12 nanoseconds. And the third one arrives with a delay of 27 nanoseconds. Now, if we imagine all of the continuous time multipath components being represented by sync functions that arrive at different delays, we get the following picture. So this first multipath component, or this first sync function, represents the first continuous time multipath component that arrives at a delay of 5 nanoseconds. Right? So you can see that the peak of this sync function is, you know, I didn't draw it exactly right, but it should be right between 0 and 10 nanoseconds. The second multipath component that arrives at a delay of 12 nanoseconds is represented by this sync function, right? So its peak occurs at around 12 nanoseconds. And finally, the final continuous time multipath reflection is represented by the sync function that arrives at a time of 27 nanoseconds. Again, does this concept or idea of modeling or imagining multipath reflections at sync as sync functions make sense? It does because remember the very first time we talked about continuous time multipath reflections um, was by using delta functions and we even drew a picture where we had that time varying channel impulse response that consisted of you know several deltas at different times sort of all stacked together and that the locations and amplitudes of the deltas would change um, slowly with time. So there we represented continuous time multipath reflections as delta functions. Here we're representing them using sync functions. Does that make sense? It does because the additional bit of information we've added to this picture is that we've assumed a band limited channel, right? And any time you limit the bandwidth of a channel, you go from a delta function, which requires infinite bandwidth, to a sync function, which is basically the inverse Fourier transform of a of a rectangular band limiting function. And so 
you can think when you look at these sync functions you can relate to the equation on the previous slide if you want or you can just think about how when you band limit a channel you go from delta functions to sync functions so rather than having deltas at the different multipath delays we have sync functions at the different multipath delays at any rate you'll notice that I've drawn lines vertical lines at our sampling intervals so if we sample at 1 over 100 megahertz we're going to select our first sample at time 0 our second sample at time 10, our third sample at time 20, and so on, right? And basically what the equation for the discrete tap, the discrete multipath tap equation does on the, on the previous slide is essentially say that the first multipath, or the first discrete time tap coefficient, H0, is going to be made up of all of the contributions of these different delayed sync functions at time zero. So if we add up these three samples that I've circled, that is going to form our first discrete time channel tap H0. Our second discrete time channel tap H1 is made up of a summation of these three samples that I'm trying to circle here. So those three samples are going to be added together to form H1. H2 will consist of a summation of these three samples, and so on. So we basically take this delayed version of the sync functions that represent the different multipath delays. We slice them according to the sampling intervals at the receiver and we add up the co contribution of each of these sync functions and that forms our discrete time channel taps. Now a useful way to look at this picture is to imagine somehow that the x-axis of our receive signal is divided into bins, right? We haven't so the, the sampling we can think of as kind of dividing our, our y or sorry our x axis into bins. And the different multipath components, these different sync functions, roughly speaking, fall into um, each of these bins. So for example, um, we would say that this first multipath component, because it you know, its largest value sort of contributes the most to this first sampling interval, we would say that this multipath component falls primarily into the first bin, if you like, the first 10 nanosecond bin. This second multipath component, because its maximum value contributes most to the, the second sampling uh, point, we would say it, you know, makes its biggest contribution to the second bin along the, the time axis. This third multipath component, you know, maybe makes its contribution really sort of to the fourth bin because it's contributing the most to the, the fourth sampling point. And so we can imagine these sort of continuous time sync functions that arrive at kind of continuous delays being sort of lumped into bins, right? And so which bin that falls into is basically determined by where the biggest contribution is made or, or is determined by the, the sampling point where the sync function makes its biggest contribution. And this idea of continuous time multipath reflections getting lumped into bins is going to be very useful a little bit later on when we talk about statistical or random small scale fading. So keep this uh, keep this concept in mind. Okay, so now we're ready to talk about statistical fading. So I mentioned in the sort of introduction part of this module that we model 
some parts of the wireless channel as random. And the small scale fading part, the effect of the, the multipath that we've been talking about for the last several slides, is one of those things that we model as a random process. And so how do we get away with modeling something as random that is really, you know, a, a function of a deterministic structure, right? So the environment, the location of objects in the environment really is sort of fixed and in, in many ways is, is not random. Well, first of all, we need to recognize that in a real channel there will, there will be just an immense number of multipath reflections, a huge number of reflections, each with its own unique channel weight C and each with its own unique delay value tau and these weights and delays are going to be constantly changing so as cars drive through an outdoor environment as wireless users even just as you move your head or as you stand up and, and walk around you're constantly causing changes in this huge number of of multipath reflections and whenever you get a large a very large number of things all changing in, in slightly different ways we quite often can model these quantities as random and so we don't model the individual multipath components as random necessarily but we model sort of their cumulative effect as as random and where do we get this sort of cumulative of, of effect well exactly in our discrete time channel tap model and so we saw in the previous slide that we can envision our discrete time channel taps as being a summation of the influence of a whole bunch of every one of these delayed sync functions that each represent a, a different multipath reflection. And whenever you add together a large number of terms, each changing in a slightly different way, you can often represent the result of that summation as a random quantity. And so our discrete time multipath component H of L can be modeled, modeled as a, a random quantity or, or what we would call a stochastic process. Now whenever you deal with a stochastic process and the reason why we call it a stochastic process is it is um, remember recall that a stochastic process is a random waveform essentially and because H is a function of the time index M and changes with M or basically changes with time H is a, a random waveform or a stochastic process and whenever you're dealing with a stochastic process you think about things like the the distribution of that stochastic process if you look at it at a particular time interval what histogram or probability density function represents um, the random values that you can get at that particular time so that's the distribution and also the autocorrelation which basically models the statistical similarity of samples of H um, collected at different times and so the distribution of the discrete time channel taps and their autocorrelation will not always be the same and in fact when we define high-level top-down channel models let's say for the outdoor um, dense urban environment or the outdoor rural environment or the indoor environment what changes in our model is not the the randomness necessarily but it what changes is the distribution and autocorrelation of our channel taps the autocorrelation will change depending on the the speed of the of the mobile user for example so as we sort of customize or tailor these high level channel models to a particular environment we really adjust the statistics of these channel taps to represent these uh, these conditions so as we get more comfortable with this idea of random fading random or representing the discrete time channel taps as a stochastic process, it's useful to look at some of the assumptions that are often made when modeling the wireless channel. So the statistical assumptions I'm referring to. Now, 
What I want to talk about here is the WSS US assumption, or which stands for Wide Sense Stationary Uncorrelated Scattering Assumption. Now, this assumption is something that is very, very commonly used in wireless system modeling, uh, wireless system simulation. You'll see it in a lot of technical papers. However, as I introduce it, I want to emphasize that you will never find this assumption is truly satisfied in a real environment, and I'll talk about why that is. So, in general, the complex, the ELF discrete time channel tap will be non-stationary with respect to time m. So, as you go along in time, a mobile user will travel between very di potentially very different environments and it's very unusual for a wireless user to experience a truly homogeneous environment. And remember the variations due to the multipath components are caused by the environment itself. And so if we're assuming stationary or stationarity in the random variations of our channel taps, we're essentially s assuming a perfectly uniform or homogeneous environment, um, perhaps some kind of very long hallway or corridor of buildings where um, the mobile is traveling in a straight line down this long corridor and experiencing the same kind of scattering the, the whole way. Obviously that doesn't happen in real life, but it's often convenient to make sort of simplifying assumptions, particularly when you're doing um, mathematical analysis or derivations, or if you are doing simulations and you want to compare your results to other results in the literature. That's a, another very important point that, that should be emphasized. These assumptions, even if they don't exactly represent what happens in real life, they're an approximation for the, the wireless channel, and if everybody works to the same assumptions, you can compare sort of apples to apples if you are simulating uh, system performance and you're comparing it to other, other literature. So the wide sense stationary assumption basically assumes that the discrete time channel tap is a wide sense stationary process. And so the autocorrelation of H is a function not of the absolute time samples that you take, uh, but just the, the difference between the two. So we sample the uh, channel tap H at time M and sample it again at time M plus K and we get a certain amount of correlation and that defines the autocorrelation function. And it doesn't, it's the time separation, it's not the absolute values of the times that matter. Clearly though in a real situation where for example a mobile user, you start a, a conversation on a telephone inside your house and then you walk outside your house and get in your car and drive away, the statistical similarity between um, successive samples of the, the fading you experience is going to be a function of time. So it's going to matter whether or not you're comparing the similarity of your fading within the time interval that you were in your house versus within the time interval that you were in your car. So again, this is an approximation that we make for convenience. It doesn't necessarily represent real life. The second assumption that we make is a little bit more realistic. So we assume uncorrelated scattering, which essentially means that if you take two different channel taps, so in this particular case, we've got channel tap at delay L, another channel tap that corresponds to delay K. We assume that these two channel taps are uncorrelated for all L not equal to K. This is actually something that you do see fairly commonly in real channels, and it has to do with the really random nature of these multipath reflections. So if we assume that the multipath reflections that make the strongest contribution to the ELF delay are 
different than the multipath reflections that make the strongest contribution to the cave delay than this assumption of statistical independence between our, our multipath taps tends to hold together. And together, these two assumptions are often taken together. And uh, when they are taken together, they lead to the wide sense stationary uncorrelated scattering channel model. OK, now that we've established a framework for the small scale channel impulse response in the discrete time domain, we are ready to start looking at some of the properties of the radio channel that really influence the performance of a wireless communication system. And the first one we're going to look at is dispersion. Dispersion basically refers to the spreading out or smearing of a communication signal. And it's pretty easy to understand how this happens in a wireless channel because at the transmitter you send out a radio signal and at the receiver multiple reflected copies arrive at the receive antenna and the further each one of those reflections has to travel, the later it's going to arrive at the receiver. And so you get multiple overlapping copies of the transmitted signal arriving at different times. So usually when we evaluate dispersion for a particular radio channel, we do it using what's known as the power delay profile, or sometimes uh, what's referred to as the PDP. So the power delay profile you can think of as kind of the average power impulse response of the radio channel. So it has multiple discrete time taps just like the discrete time channel impulse response does except the only difference is that the taps in a power delay profile are not random. In fact that they're just the average power of each of the discrete time channel impulse response taps and we can see that here. So the tap for the Elf uh, time interval or the Elf channel tap is just equal to the expected value of the random channel tap or the magnitude squared of the random channel tap. So it's it's just the power. Delay spread is the time difference between the first and last multipath component with significant energy or if you like significant power. And so we define some threshold alpha, which indicates the, um, the threshold that represents significant energy or significant power. And delay spread is just the time difference between the first and, tap and last multipath um, power delay profile taps that are above that threshold. Average delay spread is another metric for how much dispersion occurs in the channel and this is basically equal to the average the weighted average of the power delay profile taps. So this is the, the power delay profile tap value multiplied by um, the delay index L divided or normalized by the, the total power of the power delay profile and then just multiplied by the sampling interval to convert it back into seconds. And finally another very common measure is RMS delay spread which is essentially just the first moment of the power delay profile and sort of by definition it tends to be a smaller value than delay spread or average delay spread. And so these are three different definitions that just attempt to quantify the amount of dispersion we receive in the radio channel. One of the important skills that you should be trying to develop if you are going to have a career in wireless systems design is to be able to sort of look at a physical environment and be able to roughly estimate some of these performance parameters that we're talking about in this module. And dispersion is an excellent example of that. In particular, it's reasonably easy to, or to estimate delay spread.
So delay spread, again, is just the time difference between the first and the last multipath reflection with significant energy. And the way that you sort of estimate this just by looking at uh, an environment is, let's say you go into a, an indoor environment, you go into a room, and the room, the, the width of the room is approximately 20 or 30 meters, let's say, and you can say to yourself, well, all of the significant energy, or all of the multipath reflections with significant energy, are going to arrive at my receiver basically by bouncing off the walls of this room. And so if the room is, let's say, 30 meters wide, you can estimate that, you know, at most, the last multipath to arrive at your um, to arrive at your receiver with significant energy will have traveled an extra 30 meters. And then just using the speed of light formula, you can determine how much extra time it takes the radio signal to travel that extra 30 meters. And that's an estimate of the delay spread that you should see in your channel. And you can use the same trick outdoors. You can walk into an outdoor environment, look at how far the buildings are from you, estimate the distance to those buildings, and in turn use that information to estimate the delay spread. So delay spread, if you know your environment, should never be a surprise. You should be able to estimate it. And then if you're collecting measurements, that would basically just be to fine tune your estimate. Another important way we describe the radio channel, particularly as it relates to communication systems and their effect on communication systems, is whether or not the channel it is exhibiting either flat or frequency selective fading. And so what do we mean by those two terms? Well, a dispersive channel, a channel that smears out your signal in the time domain, will exhibit nulls in the frequency domain. Why is this? Well, the it's useful to look at the Fourier transform equation for the time varying discrete time multipath channel. And if we do that, we see our sort of familiar formula here where our time varying taps are multiplied by complex exponentials and added together. And so we get a frequency domain response of the radio channel. That's a function of f, obviously, frequency, but also m, because the time domain channel response changes with time, the frequency domain response of the channel is going to change with time as well. And basically, if we have more than one of these channel taps with significant energy, these complex exponentials are going to add together and cause the nulls in the frequency domain. So flat fading. Flat fading occurs when the channel has a single tap in the time domain. And when you take the Fourier transform of a single value you get in the time domain, you get a single value in the frequency domain. And so the response of a single tapped channel impulse response in the frequency domain is just a flat constant value. And of course, that single channel tap as we look at it with respect to time is going to change with time. It's not going to have a constant value because it's a function of m. And that means in the frequency domain, that flat value across frequency is also going to sort of go up and down with time. And so we see the channel tap in the time domain going up and down, and we see the flat frequency response going up and down with time in the, in the frequency domain as well. Frequency selective fading refers to the scenario where we have nulls that are caused by multiple channel taps. Right? And again, as I said when we were looking at the Fourier transform equation, if you have multiple taps with significant values or significant energies, the Fourier transform equation multiplies each one of those taps by a different complex exponential. We then add those complex exponentials together as part of the Fourier transform, and the result is a bunch of nulls or variations in the frequency domain. And the more taps you have in the time domain, the sort of quicker or the more frequently you encounter these nulls in the frequency domain. A convenient measure of how frequency selective a channel is, is something that's known as coherence bandwidth. 
and coherence bandwidth is the bandwidth over which we can assume that the magnitude of our radio channel response in the frequency domain is, is approximately constant. And so for the flat channel, coherence bandwidth is obviously infinite because it's flat across all frequencies or constant across all frequencies. But if we have nulls, we will have some finite coherence bandwidth. And we can illustrate this more effectively perhaps using a couple of pictures. And so on this slide, I show two channels. This first channel is not totally flat, but not very frequency selective either. It just has two channel taps. Whereas the left-hand channel over here has a number of channel taps with significant energy. And so we would say that this is a very dispersive channel. And so if you take the Fourier transform of the left-hand channel, you'll find some variation in the frequency domain, but not a lot of variation. It's a relatively slow variation in the frequency domain. And we would say this channel is almost flat or similar or equivalently, this channel has a very large coherence bandwidth because it's we can approximate it as constant over a relatively broad range of frequencies. Again, why is this um, variation in the channel relatively slow? Each one of these channel taps is multiplied by a different complex exponential, but because we don't have very many the complex exponentials multiplying these two channel taps are a relatively low frequency, and so we don't get a lot of variation in the in the frequency domain. That's not the case over here with our left-hand channel. Our left-hand channel has a number of channel taps, and as we sort of go along in time, we the Fourier transform equation multiplies each one of these sort of ascending channel taps with a complex exponential that's a higher and higher frequency. And as a result, we get a channel response that varies um, a fair bit in the frequency domain. And so we would say the coherence bandwidth in this left-hand channel is quite a bit smaller. And so just to illustrate that, the coherence bandwidth in the right-hand channel maybe would be as wide as that. You know this or sorry, the, the coherence bandwidth in the right-hand channel is maybe as wide as this red line. You know, it's, it's relatively constant over that interval. Whereas in the left-hand channel, the coherence bandwidth might only be that wide, right? Because it's changing a lot quicker. And you can actually estimate the coherence bandwidth based on the delay spread of the channel. Because what we've shown in, in these pictures is basically the the more dispersion you have in the channel in the time domain, the smaller your coherence bandwidth is going to be. And so there's this inverse relation. And sure enough, that's exactly how you estimate the actual numerical value of the coherence bandwidth. And so there are a couple of ways. And again, these there are, are actually quite a few equations for coherence bandwidth because they're all relatively approximate. But I've just given you a couple of the common ones here. Coherence bandwidth is approximately equal to 1 over the RMS delay spread. Or if you're using just plain old delay spread, it's approximately equal to 1 over 2 times the, uh, the delay spread. And again, these are approximate equations, but they do show you the inverse relationship between dispersion in the time domain and coherence bandwidth in the frequency domain. So just to conclude the discussion about frequency selectivity and flat or frequency selective fading, it's important to highlight the relationship between uh, or the, the part or the role that signal bandwidth has to play in whether or not the channel is considered flat or frequency selective. So remember that frequency selective fading only occurs if we have several discrete channel taps with significant energy. And so what are the factors that determine whether or not we have multiple discrete channel taps with signal energy? Well, there are basically two. The first one is environment. So remember, the environment determines the range of propagation delays over which we find multipath reflections. And so if we have an environment where reflections can arrive after traveling a relatively long distance, so if we have a lot of big significant objects that are quite a distance away from 
the transmitter and receiver, we're going to get some strong reflections off those guys, and those signals are going to arrive at um, a fairly large delay. So obviously that's a factor. But it's important to remember also that signal bandwidth is a factor. Remember what happens when we go from the continuous time radio channel response to the discrete time radio channel response. Remember uh, a number of slides back we talked about how the sampling of the continuous time channel impulse response basically divided the time axis into a series of bins and the analog or continuous time multipath reflections were a bunch of time shifted sync pulses and basically the each discrete time channel tap was calculated by determining which of those analog continuous time multipath sync pulses landed in each bin and so the bigger our bins are the more multipath components are going to get lumped into a single discrete time channel tap and so signal bandwidth plays a role here so if our signal bandwidth is quite small if we're dealing with a fairly narrow band signal we're going to get bins that are extremely wide and potentially can gather all of the analog multipath reflections into a single bin and so in in a truly sort of analog continuous time channel response there's probably really no such thing as flat fading. The only time you get a single channel tap in continuous time is if you have no reflections in your environment at all. And so I suppose that would occur perhaps maybe in some deep space scenarios. However, in basically all terrestrial scenarios, there's going to be some reflections. And so you could look at that and say, well, we, you know, we're always going to have frequency selectivity. But again, remember, the effect of these discrete time bins. If we're working with a very narrow band signal with extremely large bins on the time domain, potentially all of our multipath reflections are going to get lumped into a single bin, and so in discrete time it will look like we have a flat channel. And so flat fading generally occurs for very narrow band signals, in other words very low data rates, or in environments with scattering objects that are very close such that all of the multipath reflections arrive um, more or less at the same time. And so remember it's those two factors that you have to consider together when you're determining whether or not you're dealing with flat fading in your radio channel. Okay so having sort of finished discussing dispersion the next important thing to talk about when characterizing the discrete time radio channel is the distribution of the fading. And so when we talk about fading distributions, we're referring to the variations observed in each of the discrete time channel taps. So if you pick out one of the discrete time channel taps, that channel tap is going to vary randomly with time, with the time index m, and that can be characterized by a distribution. And it turns out that the distribution that you get in the variations in your discrete time channel tap is influenced by the type of environment that you're in. And so we characterize, as I said, we characterize random variations in the discrete time channel tap as a PDF. And remember, these variations are occurring as a function of time or t the time index m. And so what I'm going to talk about is Rayleigh and Ricean fading. And so I should say at the start that there are quite a number of distributions used to characterize wireless channel fading. Um, the Nakagami distribution is a very common one that I'm, I'm not mentioning here. But I'm going to focus on the Rayleigh and Ricean distributions because they're arguably the most commonly used. And there's a nice relationship between Rayleigh and Ricean fading. And really in Ricey and fading, both, we, both have a nice sort of physical interpretation or a nice sort of physical or link to the physical environment. And so in Rayleigh fading, we basically assume the scenario where we have a mobile device that is, um, and here this is my picture of my mobile device. Actually, maybe I'll circle it. So we have a mobile device that is 
contained in a ring of scattering objects. And so this ring that I've tried to draw here, and so I've circled the ring in red now, this ring that I've tried to draw here is a ring of objects and each of the little circles around the ring is a scattering object. And so we're assuming that a radio signal is coming towards the mobile from a, f a fair distance. You know, traditionally we've assumed large towers mounted um, at, a, at a fairly great height generating signals and none of these signals because the environment because the the mobile is so surrounded by these scattering objects there is basically no direct line of sight path between the the transmitter and the receiver the only radio channel energy that the mobile is receiving is coming from this from these scattering scattering objects and so it's a very diffuse environment. Um, we also refer to the Rayleigh fading environment as the non-line of sight environment because there's no line of sight path between the, the transmitter and the receiver. So if we assume a very large number of scattering objects all arriving at the receiver, what we do next is essentially invoke the central limit theorem to say, okay, we've got all of these signals arriving at the receiver at the same time with different random amplitudes, different random phases. That's exactly a central limit theorem type of scenario. And so we assume that both the real component of our complex channel tap and the imaginary component of the complex channel tap are normally or Gaussian distributed with a zero mean and a variance equal to one half of the power of the channel tap that we're dealing with. And the reason why it's a half is because um, we're dealing with both real and imaginary components. And so if you sum the power in the real and imaginary components, you get the total sort of variance or the total power of the channel tap. Now, this is a, a Gaussian distribution. So you might be wondering where the, the Rayleigh part is coming from. Well, if you take the or if you look at the PDF of the envelope or the magnitude of a complex zero mean Gaussian process then you get the Rayleigh distribution and so when we talk about the Rayleigh distribution or the Ricean distribution we're talking about the distribution of the magnitude or the envelope also known as the envelope of the the complex channel taps the complex distribution is in this case zero mean Gaussian and so that's the relationship between between the two. The Ricean fading scenario is very very similar to the Rayleigh fading scenario so again we assume that we have our mobile in the center of a ring of scattering objects and we're receiving a transmission from a, a faraway transmitter however the key difference between this scenario and the Rayleigh scenario is that we have the arrival of a strong line of sight component or it doesn't have to be line of sight but a strong non-random reflector so um, we generally refer to this as the line of sight scenario where you've got a visual path between the transmitter and the receiver but in addition to that line of sight object you're um, you're receiving uh, reflected uh, signals as well and so in this particular case, again, we invoke the central limit theorem and we get a Gaussian distribution for the real and the imaginary um, components of the channel tap. However, the key difference here is that the Gaussian distribution is no longer zero mean. So we have a non-zero mean that's basically a result of this line of sight component. And so the line of sight component gives us the non-zero mean and the random scattering objects give us uh, a non-zero variance to this um, Gaussian distribution. Now before we move on to the next slide it's very important for us to talk about sort of the relationship between these ring of scattering object pictures that I've drawn and the dispersive radio channel. Right. So when we were talking about the dispersive radio channel we talked about how we had a whole bunch of um, multipath components all arriving at different times. 
Now what I've done here on this slide is I've drawn you a picture where it seems like all of the multipath components are, we're kind of assuming that they're all arriving at the same time because they're all distributed around this, this ring. And so remember, in a practical environment, it's going to be relatively rare for um, multiple multipath reflections to arrive at exactly the same time in, in a continuous time channel impulse response. But remember, when we switch to the discrete time, we have the, the discrete time sampling dividing our time axis into these series of bins. And so we have all of the multipath components being lumped together as a function of these bins on the x-axis. And so when we talk about a ring of scattering objects arriving at a mobile, basically every object, and I'll try to draw my circle a little bit better this time. There we go. Basically every scattering object around this ring we would assume arrives at the mobile within the same discrete time bin. Right? So all of these multipath reflections are not arriving at exactly the same time, but at the very least they're arriving within the same time bin. And as a result, we add them together and we use the central limit theorem. If this is a frequency selective channel where we have multiple taps, you could imagine us having multiple rings. And so we have a small ring around the mobile. Let's say it's the one that I've drawn here and circled in red. And all of the reflections on this smaller ring arrive at basically exactly the same time and form one multipath tap. Then if we have a channel tap or a channel impulse response with two taps, what we would assume is that maybe there's a second ring that's much larger than the first ring. And because it's much larger, when we have a reflection that hits a scattering object on that ring and goes towards the mobile, it takes longer to get there, right? And then the same thing, you know, we have another reflection here, bounces off a scattering object, and then arrives at the mobile. And so all of the rays that are reflected from this outside ring are going to take longer to reach the mobile. They're going to fall outside of the first time bin and perhaps fall into the second time bin. And so they would be all added together with all of the multipath reflections that add within the second time bin and would form a second, perhaps Rayleigh distributed channel tap. And so when you've got multiple taps, you're basically assuming you've got multiple rings all contributing to, to different time bins. And that's a, a very important point and a very key thing to keep in mind when you're trying to link this ring picture to the concept of dispersive uh, channel taps. So for Rayleigh fading, the relationship between the Gaussian distribution of the, uh, of the real and imaginary components of the tap is to the tap average power is relatively straightforward. So the the variance of the real component plus the variance of the imaginary component is equal to the average power of the tap. It's a little bit more complicated with Ricean fading. So for the Ricean case, the average power of the channel tap is equal to the variance of the scattering component plus the square of the amplitude of the Gaussian term in the real and imaginary components. And the relationship between the relative strength of the variance, which is caused by the scattering objects, and the mean, which is caused by the line of sight component, is important, actually, because it determines how, quote unquote, severe the fading is in the radio channel. And this is quantified by a factor, by something called the K factor. So K factor, or K, is equal to the ratio of the square of the amplitude of the non-zero Gaussian distribution divided by the variance. And so, and basically as we're going to see, the higher the k-factor, or the lower the k-factor, the more serious the fading is in the radio channel. And so what does it mean when we say fading is serious? Well, the 
number one challenge, and we'll see this later on when we get into the wireless communications module, the number one challenge for wireless systems engineers is the fact that fading or random variation in the received signal strength causes the received signal power to drop to very low values, to frequently drop to very low values, and those are what are known as fades or nulls. And the more often your received signal power drops close to zero, the worse your system performance is going to be. And so we would like to have our fading distribution be concentrated around a non-zero value, and we don't want it getting close to zero very often. And so what we find with Ricean fading is that the higher the K factor is, the more the distribution of our fading is going to be concentrated around the mean of our line of sight component. The lower the K factor, the more often our signal is basically going to enter a fade or a null. And so higher K factor is um, fairly represents a fairly favorable channel, a low K factor represents a very severe channel. And in fact, there's kind of a nice relationship between the Rayleigh and Ricean fading because when K is equal to zero, basically our, um, our mean due to our line of sight component goes to zero, and we have zero mean fading in the real and imaginary components, with, which is just Rayleigh fading. And so Rayleigh fading is a special case of Ricean fading where the K factor goes to zero and in fact represents the most severe type of Ricean fading that you can have. So as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, the you know much of our conversation has been about Gaussian distributions because the Gaussian distribution represents the distribution of the real and imaginary components of the channel tab. Again, when we talk about the Rayleigh and Ricean distribution, we're talking about the distribution of the magnitude or the envelope of the channel tap. And so to conclude this discussion and to perhaps better illustrate the effect of a variation in k-factor, what I've shown here is three different distributions for the magnitude of the channel tap or the, the channel tap's envelope. And these are Ricean distributions for three different k factors, a k factor of 0, 10, and 20. Now, if we look at these three distributions, let's look at the, the one with a k factor of 0 first. And so, if you remember, a k factor of 0 corresponds to Rayleigh fading because the only way to get a k factor of 0 is to have a 0 mean, or at least an extremely large scattering variance, and that is that corresponds to the, the Rayleigh distributed channel model, 0 mean Gaussian fading on the real and imaginary components. And we said that Rayleigh fading represents sort of the worst possible um, fading situation, and we can see that when we look at the distribution. So if you look at the, the Rayleigh distribution, you'll notice that a lot of its weight is close to zero. So we have a fairly significant portion of the distribution that is below the mean, close to zero, and that means that those nulls or fades that cause us so much performance when we're trying to design a reliable wireless system occur relatively frequently. Again, what we would prefer is to not spend very much time close to zero, but rather have a signal that is relatively constant around a mean, which is more like you would expect um, if you were transmitting over a wire. So take a look now at what happens when we increase our k-factor. So if we look at the at the red distribution for a k-factor of 10, what happens is we get exactly that. Rather than spending a bunch of time close to zero, as we increase the k-factor, the fading distribution becomes more and more concentrated around the mean. And as we go to a k-factor of 20, you can see it becomes even more concentrated. And so a higher k-factor represents a stronger line of sight component, um, weaker sort of random, a weaker random scattering process, which, you know, your intuition would suggest is a more favorable case. And sure enough, uh, the distributions bear bear that intuition out in this particular case. And so the higher the k factor, the better the fading, the more concentrated it is, and the less random variation we see. Interestingly, there is a situation where Rayleigh fading will give us better performance than Ricean fading, and that occurs in a system with multiple users where we 
are using a scheduler that always transmits to the user experiencing the best channel conditions. And so in that type of scenario, if you're, if you're always picking the user with the best channel conditions, you want a distribution that goes um, fairly far above the mean. And if we look at these three distributions, it's the Rayleigh distribution, the green one, that actually has the, um, the, the largest maximum values. So even though um, it goes spends a lot of time close to zero, it spends at least um, a reasonable amount of time at fairly large magnitudes as well. And if you have a large group of users to choose from, you know, chances are you're always going to be able to find a user that's in this upper tail and you'll transmit to, on average, users that are experiencing very, very strong channel gains, much stronger than you would get if um, you had a higher K factor, which is sort of interesting. So it's the upper tails that become important on these fading distributions when you're doing multi-user scheduling. And again, that's also something that we'll talk about when we get further into, uh, into the wireless performance module. All right, I'd like to conclude the small scale fading section of this course module by talking about the rate of change of small scale fading. So we've talked about how those discrete time channel taps will change as a function of the time index M. We've talked about how we can characterize the variation that we see with time using a distribution, perhaps a Rayleigh or a Ricean distribution. But the last thing that we need to get an understanding of is how quickly those changes occur. And this can be very, very important, particularly when you're designing communication systems that require a certain amount of time to do something. So for example, if you're trying to estimate the channel and use those channel estimates in your algorithm, the longer the channel remains stationary, the longer you can perform your estimation and your better, the better your estimates are going to be. Also, some communications techniques are sensitive to how quickly the radio channel changes. Um, for example, error correction coding. So error correction coding performance will change depending on how many nulls um, occur within a, a data frame. And so s the rate of change of small scale fading is very important. So what I'm going to present to you is uh, a very standard model for the rate of change called Clark's model. Now, the most important thing for you to remember about Clark's model is that it's based on a very specific set of physical assumptions. And so Clark's model is based on the assumption that the mobile is surrounded by a ring of scattering objects. So basically the, the Rayleigh fading picture that I drew a couple of slides ago is the same scenario assumed by Clark's model. And that's the only scenario where Clark's model applies. Um, so you can use it very commonly in, uh, in your simulations, but it's important to remember the physical environment that it's tied to. So for example, if you were simulating um, radio transmission in a rural scenario, or even, even a highway scenario where the the mobile was in a vehicle and there wasn't a lot of scattering objects around the vehicle, you could not assume Clark's model for, for, those, um, for that particular scenario. So bearing that in mind, if we assume, or if we, if we bear the physical assumptions in mind, we can start to sort of move through the derivation. Now, um, this is a, Clark's model is a very detailed derivation and I'm only going to basically show you the result here. Um, so the way Clark's model starts, is um, in order to characterize the rate of change of channel variations in the time domain, we need to first go into the frequency domain. And so in a line of sight environment where there's a line of sight path between the transmitter and the receiver, motion, or at least relative motion, between the transmitter and receiver will cause a Doppler shift in the signal's carrier frequency. And the amount of that Doppler shift is given by this formula here. So the change in frequency is equal to the velocity of the mobile multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the transmitter and the receiver divided by the wavelength. And so this angle alpha is 
Um, wh when alpha is equal to zero, the um, the receiver is basically driving directly at the transmitter or directly away from the transmitter. And so when you're heading straight at the transmitter or straight away from the transmitter, that's when you experience your maximum amount of, of Doppler shift. And so um, that's what alpha an alpha or an alpha equal to zero corresponds to to that scenario. A non-zero alpha means that you're not heading exactly towards the transmitter and that reduces the amount of Doppler shift that you experience in your signal. And so in a ring of scattering objects, each ray that arrives at the mobile will experience a different Doppler shift, right? Because all of those rays are coming at the mobile um, from a different angle. So as the mobile moves through its environment, it's going to experience or it's going to receive a large number of multipath components, each with a slightly different change in, uh, or each with a slightly different uh, Doppler frequency. And so, based on this assumption, if you work through the Clark's model derivation, you will find that the autocorrelation of the discrete time channel tap, RL of K, is equal to the average power of the channel tap multiplied by this Bessel function where the term BD is equal to the maximum Doppler shift that can be experienced by um, the radio signals. C is the speed of light and FC is the carrier frequency. Now if you take the Fourier transform of this autocorrelation function you get the the power spectral density of the random variations experienced in a channel tap. And if you take the Fourier transform of this particular expression, you'll find that you get a U-shaped power spectral density. And that's a, a very sort of well-known, um, very sort of classic result for uh, um, examining the rate of change of, of small scale fading. And so um, in this ring of scattering objects, environment, you get the, the U-shaped spectrum. So this allows us to define another term, um, which is coherence time. And coherence time is approximately how long the channel remains constant. The simplest definition of coherence time, and then again there are a number of them, um, but the simplest definition of coherence time is basically 1 over the maximum Doppler frequency. So the greater the Doppler frequency, basically the faster the mobile is going or the faster the environment is changing around the mobile, and the more fluctuations you will experience in the channel, that, since there's this inverse relationship, causes a much shorter or a reduction in coherence time. And it's important at this point to remember the difference between coherence time and coherence bandwidth. Coherence bandwidth if you recall um, from a number of slides ago, refers to the, um, the amount of frequency spectrum over which we can assume the channel is constant in the frequency domain. And it, it deals with um, the frequency flat versus frequency selective scenario. Coherence time deals with something completely different. Coherence time is looking at the how long we can assume the channel is stationary in the time domain due to fluctuations in small scale fading. And so this coherence time and coherence bandwidth are not really related. So to illustrate um, the relative values of coherence time and to give you an idea of how long we can assume a, a wireless signal remains constant, I've chosen a, a, a series of values that sort of represents a typical vehicular cellular scenario, right? So we've got a carrier frequency of 1.9 gigahertz, which is a fairly typical North American cellular carrier frequency. Our um, signal or the, the wavelength of our signal is equal to 16 centimeters. The velocity of our mobile is 80 kilometers an hour, which is uh, you know, a fairly moderate vehicular speed. This corresponds to a maximum Doppler frequency of 139 hertz. 
So, if we assume that coherence time is equal to 1 over the maximum Doppler frequency, that corresponds to a coherence time of 7.2 milliseconds. So we can assume that the wireless channel in this particular scenario stays approximately constant for 7.2 milliseconds. Now, is that a long time or a short time for a wireless system? Well, if we assume a symbol time of 200 nanoseconds, which is sort of a, a typical symbol time in, in a wireless system, a high-speed wireless system, then the channel, that means the channel remains stationary for approximately 36,000 data symbols, which is a reasonably long time. So most data frames are a couple of thousand, maybe 10,000 symbols long. And so this means that we can assume that the channel remains constantly for probably at least multiple data frames, which is good news because most channel estimates will most channel estimators will operate on a time scale much lower than a symbol interval. And um, if we're using any kind of coding, then um, error correction coding will generally work on a frame by frame basis. And so we can assume a constant channel for, for that as well. And if we then sort of conclude the example by plotting the expression the, the Clark's model expression for, for autocorrelation, we can see how this rough um, estimate of coherence time actually relates to the actual correlation in the, uh, in the fading. So in our example, we assumed a coherence time of 36,000 data symbols. And so if we actually determine the correlation coefficient of two samples of our fading process separated by 36,000 data symbols, what we end up getting is a correlation of, you know, it looks like approximately minus 0.3, right? And so um, the message here is that we've probably, this rough, particular rough estimate has probably really overestimated the, uh, the coherence time. Generally, when we're assuming something is stationary, we want to assume that the, the samples will, um, you know, the, the fading can change, but it should at least be um, fairly highly correlated. And so um, generally we assume at least 50% correlated, sometimes even higher. And so if we assume that we want our coherence time definition to correspond to samples that are at least 50% correlated, we can only have um, a separation between those samples of around 17,000 data symbols. And so what this means is that probably a better estimate of coherence time for our example that we're doing right now would be 17,000 data symbols rather than 36,000 um, data symbols. And so if we really want to be conservative, if we really want to be sure that we can assume our channel is, is stationary, um, we have to use a, a much smaller estimate for this particular case. So again, remember 1 over the maximum Doppler frequency is, um, you know, that's a, a rough estimate. It's, it's good for getting sort of a, a ballpark um, idea of what the coherence time might be. But if we really want to be precise about it, it's much better to plot the autocorrelation function, decide, you know, what correlation level we want um, for us to assume that the channel remains stationary and then read off the, the amount of, of separation we can get um, right from the function as we've done here.